G'day. Angel Mahara here. I think I finally got it to work. <clears throat> so, on the topic of BPD relationship breakups and FOMO, this time the FOMO is not fear of missing out, it's fear of moving on. <clears throat> and let me just make it clear at the outset that when I say moving on, it doesn't mean that a relationship ends, ruptures, you get ghosted by the person with BP, which doesn't happen with all people with BPD. I don't mean that you then just move on as into the next relationship. Because too many people that try that, and I know I've had many clients try that, um, doesn't work out so well. So when I'm saying fear of moving on, I mean just in general, you know, like whether it's fear or some other reason or a plethora of reasons why people can't let go of the BPDX. Or maybe you've been around the circle a few times, and so, you know, hey, this is an X, but it's still really compelling. And there's so many reasons why that could be. And the other thing I was just going to insert in here, because, you know, there's, there's, there's so many things out there. I don't know if you guys think that facts matter anymore, but I kind of still believe they might a little bit. And so there was a comment, a commenter was making a comment back to another commenter, <clears throat> a little bit off the subject here, but I'll just take a little left-hand turn for a bit. And that they said to the person that the ghosting aspect of this, so the relationship they had with somebody with BPD, for me, is the significant pathology of it all, they said. So that's interesting. But could that be a disguised fear of moving on? At any rate, I just wanted to clarify that ghosting is not the pathology. That, first of all, we don't have to deal in pathology. And, hey, there's lots of channels you can listen to it if you want to hear that kind of nonsense. But so ghosting is not significant pathology at all. It comes out of other things. It comes out of those issues. Yeah, but in and of itself, that act is... But a mere reaction, well, not mere, but a reaction to either fear of abandonment or fear of engulfment, it's got nothing to do with being its own pathology. And then the other thing the commenter said was, it, it is the ghosting that has triggered a new self. I don't know if they mean for themselves or for the person with BPD, but again, this has no bearing in reality. It doesn't trigger a new self in the codependent. I think most people know that. It's like there's a world of hurt to get through first. And finding the self and healing from codependency. And it's not going to create any new self in the person who was ghosted by the person with BPD either. So, and you know, there's, there's in many things that people will say in comments people will make. There is a fear of moving on which more to the point is a fear of letting go. So it's both. It's um, the, you know, fear of letting go equals a fear of moving on equals like a whole lot of other things going on. And lots of people are aware about what that might be and lots of people aren't. So I don't know where everybody is. That's the problem with this thing here. Anyway, I'm uh, just going to see if there's anything else in the comment here. Well, they felt shattered by being ghosted. I can understand that. But then they said it's it's made it impossible for them to feel like they could ever look forward, ever move forward, ever go forward. So there's fear of moving on. Or to, to love or in life, I guess they were saying. Again, that's where there's that little bit of difference between what the person with BPD is absolutely responsible for doing and the ghosting and the pain. And then the person with codependency not being responsible for that is now responsible, though, to start to heal and to recover and to watch out for that overfocus on the cluster B or the BPDX. And then the other thing that this commenter said that I really don't think is reasonable to say, but, you know, it's not about measuring. They said it's far, far worse to be suddenly ghosted than the sudden death of a spouse. And I would say that's hyperbolic, that's histrionic, 
and that's not helpful to anybody. And also, why even compare something like that? Because that would potentially, for anybody who's experienced, and especially in the realm of BPD, an ex or a partner or a loved one that takes their own life. So uh, that, to me, is just not appropriate to say, really. Um, it's not a comparison that people should make. And this person is also forwarding a narrative on another comment that they think that everybody with BPD will inevitably ghost. So again, I'm here to say no matter what we, you know, may or may not end up talking about on this live stream, not all people with BPD are the same. They don't all ghost. And then this, this commenter continued too, you know, that this rises to the level of worst moments of pain, which I could fully well understand. And then said, when helplessly witnessing your healthy, happy wife, uh, wife's sudden collapse and comatose state of being struck by an unknown and unexpected, well, it's not a fatal illness. And it's, it's, you know, you're not really witnessing the happy, healthy, person you know so i i don't know this person seems to be in um a, a really painful amount of denial um and then they said that they wanted to offer positive thoughts to the person they commented to but someday somebody will read this and make the decision for social contact instead of torturing someone who loves them by willful neglect well Again, what's willful, what's not willful, why is it happening, how much does all that matter in terms of what you already know is a world of hurt for you, and it's painful, but if you can't get past that, I don't mean get past it, like get over it, but, but start to move forward to be able to get into your own healing and recovery. So it does involve facing many different ways that people have fear of moving on and also the letting go. Oh, hey there, um, 1991 Windsor. And Rab, you said, hi, Jay. I went on dating um, websites this past year. It's even, it's even a positive trait to write, quote, I will not ghost anyone. Laugh out loud. Oh, my God. You know, yeah, dating websites, dating apps, seem to just be cluster B havens, you know. It's what I've heard a lot of people talk about, um, a lot of clients mention, and just generally what, well, my opinion is anyway, because I don't really think that there's, um, you know, there's, there's more and more people that if they're not diagnosable with BPD or NPD, they're darn close. And so um, they're out there with all these problems because, it is exponentially increasing, and that's the really sad news. Because the treatment, or people wanting treatment, is not going to keep up whatsoever. So that's a real issue. But, you know, when it comes to fear of moving on, I think people might not, they might think, well, what's that mean, right? Like, but it means all of anything and everything why you feel like you can't let go of the BPD or NPDX, right? But specifically BPD here. So I think it's really important that people think about this because, again, so much happens. And yes, they do so much horrible stuff. And again, it's not everybody with BPD being the same. And again, I just want to say BPD is not a disease or a brain condition or as continues to be forwarded elsewhere. What can you do, right? But I guess some people love misinformation. So anyway, I think that I'm going to have to prattle on here. Okay. Because um, the hope would be that there'd be some interaction and people would have some things to say or share. But... So now I'm going to have to think about, hmm. So fear, I think fear of moving on really encompasses so many different moving parts of what people are feeling and experiencing and confused by and not, not able to accept because 
it is hard to accept what you don't understand. But then again, that's that's the hamster wheel of like trying to understand the person with BPD or more about BPD. And, but like that keeps that you can't do that. Well, people can after a while, but initially you can't do that and be starting to move on, meaning getting into your own healing and recovery and that letting go. It's hard to do both at the same time. And Rav said the fear of moving um, on is definitely scary. What kept me from moving on at first was keeping in contact with my ex. I even used to cancel dates out of guilt. Well, yeah, that's understandable. And I mean, contact is a big issue, right? That many, many people still have and, and many people, you know, have gone full no contact. But anything less than full no contact, of course, you know, people aren't going to be able to move on to be able to get into recovery and to be able to let go. Because how do you let go or change anything for yourself? Or how could you even change how you feel when you're still in contact with them, right? And this is so compelling for people, you know, in general, but people with codependency, which I think is more people than not, different varying degrees of that, of course. Not everybody with codependency is the same, just as, and I'm not defending people with BPD when I say, but they're not all the same either. So, but I, I think it's interesting in the work I do with clients, all the reasons why why and how they exhibit fear of moving on because and you know remember moving on means just starting to let the ex go not like jumping ahead in your life like everything's fabulous and rob said i actually used to cancel dates because i was so scared that she would do something to hurt me back um but then when i went no contact i felt free well that's yeah, I can understand that. And it's a good thing when you went no contact that you felt, you know, free because it's difficult and there can be a pain at pain attached to that for people for a while. But it, it is so freeing at the same time. In 1991, Windsor, you said, I've been ruminating over this relationship for two and a half years. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And I feel like I'm never going to recover from it. Or be able to trust anyone again. I find myself just self-isolating at home. Wow, that's got to be difficult. And of course, we don't live in a simple world right now either. But um, I wonder if, you know, have have you tried to do some things differently for yourself? Or does, it kind of, does the rumination kind of take over? And, um... And feeling like you'll never recover, by the way, is a feeling. So it doesn't make it so. But it depends what you're doing or not doing more specifically, like even small steps to help change your experience so that you can, I don't know if if you're stuck, stuck, or if you've been doing some healing work, but you said the ruminating has been going on for two and a half years. So that that is a little bit longer period of time happens to many people but i wonder if you're able to help yourself or you know have like how is that pervasively every day or do you find that there's some quality time outside of that that you can find for yourself i don't know because that would be extremely difficult and I certainly don't want you to feel like you're alone with that because there are people that ruminate over the, you know, a relationship for, for even longer than what you're talking about. But obviously there's something you need to do or some steps. I don't know what you are doing or have done or haven't done, but some steps you need to start taking in terms of radical acceptance being able to, you know, get to the point of letting go. And, and I don't know, maybe you've done some of that, but the fear of moving on, you know, it, it's like trying what really helps people. Rumination is very difficult. One thing that really helps is just trying to be, first of all, radically accepting. Secondly, which doesn't mean accepting, accepting, right? Um, Like what they did to you is not okay. And the second thing is really about getting into a mindfulness 
of being as present as you can be to each moment, which is not easy, but that can be a way, and other skills in mindfulness can be a way to really pattern interrupt the rumination and the constant thinking about them. But that focus is definitely one that keeps people stuck and blocked and also feels extremely compelling, and it's a very difficult pattern to break. And the person, the ex with BPD is, is also likely for many people, well, is for many people, I can't say for everybody, over-focused on, ruminated about, etc., the pain and everything that happens, but also because they represent for many codependents to your wounded inner child, so unconsciously they represent much more than even, you know, all that they've left you with and all of the confusion and all of the conflictual feelings and, and all of the hurt and pain and more. And then you said, I don't stay at home all the time and I do go places, but I'm not the happy-go-lucky person I once was. And I don't know if I'll ever be that person again. I think this um, changes you forever. Well, I think probably there's, there's truth to that, but what people do have the empowerment to in a healing and recovery process, and I recommend everybody works with somebody through this, you have the, um, you can empower yourself in a healing and recovery journey to, to really make the choice about how, you, you know, how you're going to be different, that you won't ever be the same person again. And I think I think for you, it sounds like what you're saying is like, I've lost too much of myself. This hurts too much. And I'm never going to be the same. And and there's some truth to that. But then again, if you have codependency and if you think about it, well, that's very painful, but do you really want to be the same? So then it becomes getting into that healing recovery journey, working with someone so that you can make the choice as to who you are going to become which is working on that, creating a healthy relationship to and with yourself and defining that for yourself. And for many people with codependency, it will be for the first time in their lives because codependency with the seeds of it in childhood is that pursuit, that pursuit of needs one way or another. Many different things happen to many different people to various degrees in their childhoods. But Codependents can really empower themselves after these relationships. It's not easy. It's painful. But working with someone and in that healing process, you can actually, you need to find out who you are so you can determine who you can be going forward, whether that encapsulates partially who you were or largely who you were before or not. You might be surprised that it that you haven't really lost yourself to the degree to which you think you could never be yourself again. But what I'm just adding in there is you can be an even healthier, more knowledgeable, aware, bounded version of a little bit of a different you. So there's some positivity in there within all the pain in healing and recovery processes to really get to know self in a very new and different and healthier way implementing and creating boundaries and you know and, and the other thing I work with clients on too there's so many different moving pieces but another one I'd like to stress here is assertiveness you know people with codependency aren't usually that assertive and that's another thing you know assertiveness training learning how to assert oneself so you not only develop boundaries you implement them you understand them you start to heal from all that happened from the person with BP in your life and then you start to find yourself and then that inner child healing work. So codependents can empower themselves more than it absolutely feels like. Like when you're in that pain after, and it doesn't matter how long after the relationship, you know, it's, it's very, very painful and difficult, obviously. And, um, I'm not going to have any luck saying your name there. Sorry, but you said she's ghosting me for the first time. We've been together for six months. And it was the best six months. Nothing serious happened. She said she needs a few days. Do you think it will 100% percent 
repeat. Yes, it will 100% repeat. And right now she said she needs a few days. Well, if that's the case, she because there's everybody with BPD is different. So some will ghost and they will come back in a couple to a few days. They they each have their own patterns. So if she does come back within that time frame, it doesn't really make what she did okay. But then what you're going to find is you're going to get together again and then you're going to go ahead and then whatever's triggering her, uh, which she's responsible for, She's going to need one of those breaks again that's a ghosting situation. And it will be on and off and on and off like that. Because until they get significant treatment, which takes many, many years, they can't they can't make those kind of changes. Um, hey there, Sarah. Um, it's super hard to start over after BPDX, but <clears throat> so within our power. Um, it's the first time in my life I can be me. Yeah, scary but exciting. Well, and the, and and that is, you know, when these relationships are ended by people, you know, like or go or like who are with people at BPD or you know, you get ghosted or however they end, then what is it but it's crisis meets opportunity. And you can't control the crisis, but you could control the opportunity. But it's not without pain. And then I'm sorry the person whose name I can't say um, and I also didn't understand much about BPD until she ghosted me. Well, yeah, and the thing about that is once somebody with BPD does ghost, it like, you know, it's a pattern. It's part of their pattern. And, you know, I don't know what would have triggered her, but it could be fear of engulfment. Might have got, you know, been too close and, and people with BPD don't know how to have that closeness or tolerate it. They feel controlled and they need to get away. And then, you know, she's likely going to come back. But she's likely going to come back to ghost again, to come back to ghost again, to come back to ghost again. Which is the really sad news about it all. Uh, Roller girl, we choose to stay stuck in the chicken coop in our mind when the gate is wide open. We choose. It's very true. Very, very well said because people with codependency really do choose, you know, whether it's staying in the relationship or it doesn't feel like much of a choice when you're in a lot of pain and you can't stop thinking about them and you're ruminating. But but there are other choices you can learn to make and to pattern interrupt. And so there are elements of choice to these things for sure that people aren't always aware of. And Sarah said, yes, very painful. So many memories and flashbacks and confusion. My family say they can see that I'm working on something serious in my face. Well, that's good. I mean, and, and you know, it, it, I'm just so happy for you that you were able to make the decision to finally leave. And, and I don't mean any judgment with the word finally in there. But yeah, this is not easy stuff to do. But so, and then you continue to make progress, right? One step at a time. Uh, who's Prue? Said, hi, AJ. Do most people with borderline realize their behavior can be, um, yeah, like really poor treatment? Um, no, most don't actually. And then you said, how do you bring up therapy and prevent defensiveness? That's, that's an impossibility right there. You, you can bring up therapy, but you can't prevent the defensiveness because that's, you know, understandable why you would like to be able to bring it up and hope they wouldn't get defensive, but you don't have any control over that. And you know what? Neither do people with BPD untreated. They don't have any control over what's going to trigger them, though it's their responsibility. And it's not your fault if they get triggered. But if you bring up therapy, she'll probably, he or she will probably get instantly triggered and instantly defensive. So there's nothing you can do about that. Hey there, Al. How are you doing? And so I think that um, also to your to your question there, a lot of people with BPD don't realize how their behavior is impacting other people. Sometimes they might realize after the fact, and they might really be sorry about it, but it doesn't mean they understand it in any way that they could change it. And when you're in a relationship with somebody with BPD and you're looking to have that talk about bringing up therapy, by the way, um the sobering reality that you have to think about or you, you'd be best served to think about as well 
is the fact that even if they will go to therapy, recovery requires 8 to 16 years worth of therapy. So this idea out there, they can go to DBT for a year or two and it's all good, it's not true. They can manage symptoms somewhat better, but that can take more than a year or two. So again, people wanting to get them into the conversation to try to get them to therapy, you're really not going to get any relief for quite a long time. Because even if they go to therapy, even if, if they go and, and are with a therapist that knows what they're doing, because there's lots that don't out there, 50% in America that won't even touch somebody, doesn't want to, you know, treat anybody with BPD. So, but even if you can get them to go, you can't make them engage it. You know, you got to make sure it's a good fit. And even then after that, it takes years. So. That's why I recommend people who already know that something isn't working as painful as it is, wanting to get the person with BPD to go to therapy, understandable, but it's not really going to provide or yield any change in the person or the relationship for a long, way too long a time. Um, Heather, uh, hi, AJ. My, my brain keeps ruminating over him. I cry all the time because I can't come to terms. It's over, and it's been a year. How can I get this to stop? I'm in therapy working on myself. Well, I think the first question I would ask you, and you don't have to answer me, but to think about is, what's happening in that therapy? Like, um, I don't know how long you've been in the therapy, but is it is it helping you at all with the rumination? Is it helping you with um, what you can't get to stop? Because that's the hope right there. You know, that's one of the first steps, actually. But, in, in you know, rumination is, um, it becomes a pattern as part of the externalization and codependency. Because when you're ruminating and focusing on the X, you are still self-abandoning yourself, not consciously, right? And you are still not... Um, Basing your own pain, and you might be a little bit, but lots of people aren't, basing their own pain or really dealing with themselves. So the rumination is not only strong for many reasons, but it also becomes the, the, the place of codependent, you know, inability to let go, fear of moving on, and can be tremendous fear of looking at self. And, and feeling what one really feels. And not only about what's happened in the relationship and healing from that, but where does it go back to in your past? Because for more people than not, there are those connectors. So in, in trying to stop ruminating, the best thing to do is first radically accept the relationship is over. So that, that might be accomplished in many different ways, but I wonder if your therapist is mentioning any of this. And then secondly, it's that mindfulness, like I said, and I have a video up. I don't know what it's called. I wish I could find it, but um, it's one of the live stream clips where I talk about mindfulness and maybe radical acceptance, mindful focus and mindful describe and mindful distract so that you can interrupt because those are pattern interrupters of rumination. And when you pattern interrupt it with a mindful focus or like, just stare at a doorknob and describe the doorknob or describe a lamp. And you might think, oh my God, why would I want to do that? Well, because if you start describing a lamp, if you're just sitting there by yourself and you're like, okay, the lamp shade is this color and the lamp has this kind of a knob that turns it on and off and the bulb is whatever wattage or whatever it's called these days and all that. While you're doing that, which seems inane and, who, you know, like who'd want to do that, that's just called mindfulness describe. It's an example your brain can't focus on the ruminating and describing a lamp at the same time. So the pattern interrupter becomes is trying to be as mindful to the moment as possible. And mindfulness described is, is also a distraction technique, can lead to grounding work, and also will, will your brain just can't do the two things at once. So that's one suggestion I would have. And then, of course, there's a lot more to... um you know, and, and you need to come to terms with radically accepting it's over. And 
that might really, I don't know you, right? But that might be really something that your inner child is re-experiencing that is just making this, as it does for many people with codependency when these relationships are over, even after quite a time, makes it just impossible to, to like stop ruminating and, and to accept that it's over because it's not all about your ex as much as it might seem so in the here and now. There's something else going on deep in your subconscious with the wounded inner child. And now, um, don't waste your time with an untreated BPD. Leave, run. You'll love yourself and your whole life. Yes. Of course, it's not that easy, but people, that's, everybody's got to, at one point or another, let go and deal with the fear of moving forward, which involves healing before moving totally on. And then you said, um, AJ, I don't get notifications of your live streams. Are they planned um, or spontaneous? I would love to get a heads up. Thanks. Well, I put it up a half an hour ahead. So um, it, if you subscribe to the channel, you hit the notification bell, hit all, then you should get the notification. And sometimes they don't work so well. But if you've hit the, if you've subscribed and hit the notification bell, then you should be getting. You might want to just go back and hit, you know, turn the notification bell off and turn it back on to all, and hopefully you'll you'll be um, getting that um, notification. But no, they're more spontaneous with me. I mean, whether I plan it or not, like you know, if I ever know further in advance, I will definitely give more advanced time. But I had so much trouble. I was trying off and on since about eight o'clock, and I just kept having problems between the streaming and the, you know, the, the, the software to stream and the thing. And the, so I had to try over and then I decided, well, I better go get dinner first anyways. And so, yeah, it can be quite spontaneous, but the only way to get a notification is when, I don't know if you get, I love an answer to this question. Does anybody know if you get notified when I put up that a live stream is upcoming? Or do you only get notified when it goes live? Because I don't know which way it is. Because if I can give more lead time, certainly that might help. If you get notified once the live stream is created that it's coming up. I don't know if that's the way it goes or not. Um, and uh, Roller Girl, my boyfriend was diagnosed with bipolar schizophrenia. Oh. Yeah, bipolar schizophrenia as in like somehow that's a combo or you just mean both. I think it's more like BPD and NPD than BPD schizo. Well, I don't even understand. Or BP, you said, yes. I don't understand that at all. It just sounds like a clinician who doesn't know what the hell they're doing, to put it mildly, okay? Because with bipolar and schizophrenia, I mean, I guess it could happen, but like, and then you think BPD, NPD, okay, well, but, like, they should get reassessed. And and the whole thing sounds like it might be just too much to to deal with. I mean, I don't know. But the, the, the people that are, oh, man, shrinks. And maybe some psychologists, too. But, like, I don't know what's going on in, in the world of diagnoses because it's like there are just so many clinicians out there that don't know what they're doing at all. Because how do you come up with bipolar and schizophrenia? I don't even think those two things coexist much in people, but I don't know. Um, Sarah, make a plan if you can and leave the BPD or just leave. If you're frozen and can't move, get some help. See a doctor or counselor or plan again. Um, yeah, BPDs do damage. For sure they do. Now, I might need to hit the notification bell again. Thanks. Oh, okay. Well, I hope that helps. And Rob said, I get notified when it goes live. Oh, okay, so even if I were one day to put it up three hours in advance or a day before, uh, then unless you go by the channel, you wouldn't know until it goes live. Kind of what I thought. Thank you, Heather. You said the same thing. That's kind of what I thought it was like. Because it really shouldn't be like that. But, like, you know, hey, it is what it is. Um, Roller Girl, his anger goes from zero to ten in seconds like a child. He's 59 and was in prison for many years. He takes meds for bipolar. Well, I don't mean to devalue anybody, but he sounds like a real sweetheart. Not. Um, sounds like he might be quite a dangerous individual. And at his age, 
I mean, he needs a proper diagnosis, but at his age, it's not like probably he's going to be able to change a whole lot, but it really depends what the issues really are. Um, yeah, only when it goes live. Adrian, I got notified when it went live. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, yep, everybody, well, a lot of people chimed in on that. Um, thank you for that. Well, I don't know if it's most, Al, but certainly it's not pew. It's, it's, yeah, it happens often that they'll get misdiagnosed as bipolar in the beginning. And a lot of people with bipolar will get misdiagnosed as BPD in the beginning. So I don't know how they explain that. And then you said the clinicians, doctors spend very little time with them. No surprise they get the diagnosis wrong. Well, this is true because, you know, a lot of them aren't even really doing a proper you know, diagnosis, a proper assessment. Um, you're not supposed to just talk to somebody for 10 or 15 minutes and then write something down and then medicate them accordingly. Uh, that's not an assessment. And 1991 Windsor, I was notified when it was live, but it was already a few minutes into it when it notified me. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, and you said, thank you for the recommendation on trying to focus on other things. And practicing mindfulness, I definitely will need to try that. Well, yeah, and, and just know it's a practice, right? So you might not find it so helpful the first few times you do it, but the more you do it, the more helpful it will be. And especially, I always recommend to people and to clients to do the mindfulness to scribe because you don't have to describe a lamp. You know, like if you have a view or if you happen to live near water, I mean, you can really describe whatever's, you know, the best thing you can find um, that that would be able to be more described. But that's just one aspect of mindfulness. It's certainly not the whole enchilada by any means. Little girl, he's improving some days, but every day is a whole new learning curve um, for both of you. Well, um, to what degree that's healthy or not, I don't know, but like it's obviously your choice. But I mean, he needs to be properly assessed because if he's still on meds, yeah, you've been together for quite a while. If he's still on meds for bipolar and that's what he should be on, well, good. But it doesn't sound like you really know that. And then if he was diagnosed bipolar with schizophrenia, what about meds for the schizophrenia? So, I mean, I don't know. It just sounds like, and then you think he's BPD, NPD. So, like, somewhere somebody's dropped the ball hugely. So he really should go for another, for, for an absolute full assessment. And then, and then maybe if it is bipolar or schizophrenia or somehow both, which I don't think is that common, I don't know. Um, if he was medicated properly in those two circumstances, that would make a huge difference. And if it's not those two things and it is BPD or BPD and NPD, well, then of course there aren't really meds that help that. Um, Dave Gar, I sure hope my wife doesn't have BPD. We share the same YouTube account, and she watches your videos obsessively. Oh, my. That's interesting. Um, I, I wonder, do you have any other thoughts why she'd be watching my videos obsessively? Uh, Al, I want no contact after 20 years with my ex-BPD. The weight that lifted off my shoulders was immense. There's more um, legal, yeah, stuff coming, but the relief and freedom is priceless. Yeah, well said. Um, and Sarah, is it possible the ex uh, of a BPD can get clinically depressed if they are codependent? Yeah, you know, it. I, yes, I think I would like to, to parse it this way. It's not really by the very nature of the definition of your circumstance in the human context not really clinical depression, but you can have a lot of depression. But what I would recommend people do is don't go run into some shrink for meds and think it's a clinical depression. It's just depression. It's circumstance related. You know, you just, you just left a person that you were with for a long time and you went through a heck of a lot with and then some, and now your whole life is changing. And if you're feeling depressed and or anxious and or one or the other or both off and on, that's when people have to be really careful about learning coping tools and techniques so that you don't take off to some doctor and get 
psych meds you don't need because it's not likely to be a clinical depression. It's likely to be, you know, what what the pseudoscience is. See, I can't get through a video without saying, can I? Or a podcast or whatever this is. The the pseudoscience of the APA, they don't, and, and doctors today, they don't make any allowance for the fact, look what you're going through, Sarah. You're going to have depression. You probably have anxiety at times, but it's situationally appropriate, actually. Those are called, quote, normal feelings when you're going through what you're going through. So I don't think that I would be in a hurry to say somebody is clinically depressed in your situation or after leaving a person with BPD and your whole life changing and having a lot of pain and work to, you know, healing to do. It, it's kind of like situationally appropriate, even though it's unfortunate and it's not a nice way to feel. But I think it will resolve on your healing and recovery journey. And I don't, you know, it depends what people think, but that's, that's the way I look at it from the humanistic context experience of what people are going through. And, and, you know, psychiatry or family doctors are all tw qu too quick to just hand out psych meds like they're candy and say, well, you know, you must have a clinical depression. Well, clinical depression doesn't just come on in like two or three or four months either. So it's likely the situation in which the context for said means you might be going through a lot of depression, you might be going through a lot of anxiety, but, you know, the grieving process will likely take care of the depression. And maybe there's some anger turned inward, inward that's also adding to depression. And 1991 Windsor, my ex told me once he had bipolar disorder, but I do not believe that. I never saw him go through any cycles, and he had zero empathy. Well, people with BPD don't necessarily have zero empathy, but I hear you. Um, what what stinks in the United States is um, insurance. Yeah, well, in the U.S., there's so much mis mis not really diagnosing that goes on too, but mislabeling because they'll write down clinical depression or they'll write down bipolar. Yeah, because insurance, if they write down BPD, they're unlikely to get a dime which is a horrific situation because BPD requires long-term treatment. And even though people pay into insurance forever, insurance companies never want to do the right thing back. Um, who's Prue? Why does my BPD partner blame me for everything that's wrong in her life? Well, it, it goes back to early childhood. It's a complicated, long explanation. I'll spare you, but like they learn to externalize all their feelings because they're too much. They don't know how to handle it, depending on what our childhood was really like. But that's the reason, doesn't excuse it. But because every time she gets triggered and she thinks it's your fault, it's not, then when she has all these feelings that she does not know why she has, that could include anxiety or panic or just really horrible, painful, distressing feelings, then she doesn't know why she's feeling what she's feeling. And what they, what most people with BPD until they get some treatment do is they externalize it out to the person closest and you must be like, you're near me. You must be the one that's doing it to me. So it, it's, it's that process of their defense mechanisms, which they learned early in childhood, which doesn't excuse it, but that's why they externalize it out and blame you, even though it's not your fault. And Ram said, I think, um, I thank my lucky stars. One of my friends in 2004 warned me not to take any anxiety meds. My doctor wanted to prescribe to me. She had the worst withdrawals. Uh, yeah. And, and this is uh, psych meds. Yeah. <clears throat> they should be avoided at all costs. Now, are some people maybe going to need them for a short period of time, perhaps, but there's always ways to learn to cope and manage, you know, stress, anxiety, even depression. Um, and people really need to know that, you know, look up Dr. Peter Bregan on this. He's a psychiatrist who talks about the dangers of that medication. And Sarah said, I agree, but the crappy feeling and having no appetite wears on you. I'm trying lots of self-care and distraction. Well, I'm glad my videos help. And the other thing is, I hope you're including exercise because that can be difficult to do if you feel depressed, but it can be really important. So, you know, trying to get enough sleep, exercise, 
eating right, that kind of self-care, like like you described, you're taking lots of self-care. And then, um, you know, it's going to take time also because it's dependent on, you know, your grieving process, which isn't going to be over with in a hurry. And, um, yeah, just finding your way forward one step at a time, really. So it will take more time than people think they can stand, but it's, it's not situationally, um, unexpected if I can put it that way, but I know it's very uncomfortable. So it's really important for people to exercise because, and the other thing too, Sarah, is I don't know if you feel angry or you really get in touch with the anger, but for a lot of people, the anger kind of gets suppressed somewhat and or so, so some depression experienced quite a bit of people's depression experienced in these situations can be anger turned inward. So that's another possibility. And, and are you feeling your feelings would be the other question because it's really important to grieve. Roller girl, um, he does hear voices and takes meds for that. His anger burst outburst is why he was diagnosed with bipolar. Well, that doesn't make any sense. An anger, uh, you know, outburst does not bipolar make necessarily. I tell him that he needs to be truthful with his therapist about his BP NPD tendencies. Well, and you know, I, I know that people pick up on these patterns, but if he hasn't been diagnosed with that, he should be reassessed. But obviously it seems like, so what's in question is the bipolar. It sounds like more than schizophrenia. But do you know how really rare it is for schizophrenia, BPD, and NPD to coexist? Even though that's not what the APA is forwarding right now? So that's a mixed bag. I really, I really, you know, wish I could be more helpful, but obviously I don't know what's going on with him. Um, now, antidepressants and, um, yes, that, <laughs> I don't know, were two of the worst meds I ever have been um, prescribed. I would rather deal with it myself. GPs are prescribing, yeah, all kinds of meds. and Oh, that's what that is. Okay, because they're called different things in every country. For insomnia, like candy, and well, not just in Australia, they're doing it in all kinds of countries. Yeah. Um, 1991, Windsor said, I forgot to mention that I think he was more narcissistic, but I believe, um, think he was actually BPD, NPD comorbid. Well, and you know what? At the end of the day, whatever it really was, it's been, you know, too much for you and really painful, right? So, again, you know, do, do you want to work that out some more or do you care about that anymore in terms of that, you know, what happened to you and is it not time to focus on you, codependency and your healing and whether it was BPD or NPD or comorbidity both is not really going to help you now, right? Like that fact alone, it's like, so it's, it's really important to not really focus on that because how is that going to help you? with fear of moving forward or inability to let go. And Sarah said, yes, I'm angry, which is not like the old me. I tell rude people off at the store and I'm short with my kids and coworkers. I think um, it's okay, almost like I'm more in tune with me and have found my voice. Well, yeah, um, but you don't, you don't want to be, oh, you tell rude people off. Okay. So yeah, if you're doing that in an absurd, in an assertive way, then yeah, that's positive for sure. And, um, and it sounds like you're probably becoming more aware of what your boundaries are. And like you said, finding your voice. So, and, and if you know your anger and you feel your anger, that's, that's healthy. So then, you know, what might be, um, contributing to the depression is simply the fact that there's more grieving to do. Well, not simply. It's not simple at all. It's complicated. But, you know, it, it's just, it's interesting because it varies so greatly amongst people. But so many people have trouble realizing that the relationship is over or not realizing it, but like even after a year or two or more accepting it, because obviously people kind of know, but it's the acceptance of it. And then people need to think about what might be blocking you're accepting that it's over. And of course that goes to 
not only the fear of moving on, like getting into your own recovery, but, you know, all of those other moving pieces, like, you know, the why question and the cognitive dissonance and, you know, all kinds of different things. So, but while all that is present and needs to be worked through and processed, and, you know, also focus has to be shifted, but I mean, it, it's kind of different for every single person that's going through this, too. So I want to be careful when I say things that, you know, because obviously here I'm saying things much more generally. So and just a reminder that if anyone's interested, I'm going to be starting up those BPD relationship recovery support group and a codependency recovery support group. And um, maybe with an eye to group therapy or I guess what I would have to call because people all over the world group coaching, but of course I'm still doing the one-on-ones primarily. But I think it's, it's really super difficult for people and so much pain and also confusion and bewilderment and, and all of the various things that happen. And my words aren't going to do justice to how people feel. It's like, it's really difficult to realize the opportunity along with the crisis, right? Because because the opportunity is a huge one. And pursuing the opportunity aspect of the adversity of working through fear of moving on to get into healing recovery to radically accepting that it's over is not simple or easy, but it's one step at a time. And then it starts to make the next step and the next step more possible. And um, you said it's hard to forgive yourself for staying for 29 years. So many moving pieces, lots of grieving, and lots of shifting, and many people involved. Well, yes, absolutely, because that is a really long time. And, um, and, and, you know, you have to keep remembering that in the sense, I mean, you know, forgiving yourself will take time because you need to grieve and you need to heal a bit more and and everybody's different but you go at your own pace and um it's just really important to try not i mean to keep tr refocusing when you might be being hard on yourself and, and you know because you stayed for that long but you have to remember that you know so much more now and you didn't know then and you know I'm, it, it's always very painful when people have that many years in a relationship and or might consider those years to have rather been not well spent, you know. So I hear you on that. And Alice said 20 plus years. Wow, yeah, it's a long, lot of time, isn't it? And then said just be grateful you didn't take it, um, yeah, all the way to the end of your life like many have and, and many more likely will do, unfortunately. Because, you know, these are... This is the reason why I'm always, you know, I'm not trying to defend people with BPD at all, but they're not all the same. And the other thing is, so, and neither are all codependents, right? People are going to go through these processes. There's some patterns and some similarities, but there's vast differences from individual to, indiv to individual as well. And, you know, I mean, for me, when I look back at my recovery from the family of origin from BPD healing and recovery and some other things I had to heal and recover from along the way from that too. I mean, that took me till I was almost 30 and I started therapy when I was 16. So, and then I, and then I consider sort of from the age of <laughs> the beginning of my life really, but when I was cognizantly aware of stuff, which I didn't know what was going on in that family of origin, what I'm trying to speak to is in a different way, I lost a good 25, 28 years of my life at being much younger, right? And in my childhood to everything that, you know, happened to me from the cluster B parents. So it's like, it's a grieving process for, for the lost time too. It's a grieving process for the investment of time um, on either side of the fence in that regard. So, you know, anybody that's really... Uh, healing and recovering from BP. But again, I don't want to focus on that too much because of course, 
everybody that watches my channel, people that are in relationships with someone with BPD, just got ghosted, break up, left them, etc. You're not dealing with any with people with BPD that have got any treatment or significant treatment at all. And so that's why I say there's a I don't know, it might be the majority of people with BPD, but certainly that's what most people are dealing with. So again, just I don't want to keep reiterating it, but because of the misinformation out there, they're just not all the same. But it doesn't mean that most of them untreated won't be hurting people for sure. I also said some codependents will do 20 years. Um, will, will not do 20 years, but their whole lives. And many, many, um, with many, many different BPD or MPs. That's very true. It's about who you attract until you know how to protect yourself. Well, yeah, and, and of course, what seems like it's about who you attract in an here and now conscious mind, it's really more about the codependency patterns, the inner child, the wounded inner child, and what's really being attracted at that depth of level that goes back to the familiarity of the wounded inner child to this next cluster B replicating parent in some way, even if you didn't have a cluster B parent. Um, Sarah, opportunities are here to move um, forward and heal. I know. Um, thank you for validating that. It will take time. Some people think I will be all healed in six months and good to go. Oh, no, you need way more time. I mean, after 29 years, why would people be thinking that? Well, that's not very kind of them or very realistic of them. Oh, well, Stephanie, I'm sorry to hear that you're struggling. I am i don't um, know. Oh, you said I got ghosted um, through an email five years, and I can't seem to pull myself out of this depression and sadness. I'm so sorry to hear that because I don't know if you've sought help. Um, but if you haven't, you know, maybe that would be a good idea. And I don't know if you identify with codependency or not. But again, that's something to think about. Because, um, you know, there's something going on there that obviously if you knew what it was, you'd change it, right? And five years is a really heck of a long time. I'm really sorry to hear that. It sounds like it might go deeper, you know, back to your childhood and not only, you know, be about that person that ghosted you, yes, but be also about something deeper inside of you that you need to get in touch with. It seems like, in my experience working with clients, you know, the more time that goes by, like two, three, five years, um, oh, you said you do identify the codependency. Yes. Okay. And, and the more time that goes by and people are kind of still stuck, it really usually means it's significantly about a wounded inner child and that duality, right? That it's about the ex, but that, you know, consciously you know that, but the subconscious piece is about what it's about deeper. And why people need to get into healing recovery processes best off with, you know, someone like myself, if I resonate with you, or someone that you know understands, you know, BPD, NPD, and codependency. Because certainly there are a plethora of mental health um, professionals out there who just don't know anything about this area at all. And that's not to say anything negative about them. Because they probably train in, in other things and they specialize in other areas. But, um, yeah. And Al said, my therapist did me a disservice. 15 sessions she had no experience with BPD was a waste of time and money. Make sure you deal with a specialist like AJ. Oh, well, thank you for that, Al. But I'm so sorry to hear what happened because that happens to so many people. And people think, well... You know, okay, you find a therapist and everything should work out and, you know, they're going to help you. Well, they don't all know what you're talking about. And they can't all know that. And like I said, there's many reasons for that. And that's not me putting other mental health professionals down. It's like 
they work in different areas. And the other thing I think that's really true is, you know, when, when you get a university education, it doesn't matter. You don't learn. They, they do not teach much about the, quote, personality disorders or the clusters in particular or cluster B specifically at all. And so people have to make it their business to learn more about it. Or, I mean, I know about it from lived experience and having two cluster B parents, of course, fitting those pieces together later because I didn't know what it was in the beginning. But when I started university, I started to learn a lot. I mean, I remember sitting in lectures where, you know, just learning the basics. And, and one time a professor drew these circles you know, and one was like mother and the other was father. And then he drew a circle in the middle where the children should be. And I was like, what? And then he explained about different things, but, but he still wasn't getting into the area of personality disorders or, or, you know, codependency and all of these things that we talk about on this channel and um, <clears throat> that people are going through. But I had this moment right there and it's like, I don't remember what it was. It was like, a, I forget what the course was called. But it was it was in psychology, obviously. But then he says he gives another like dysfunctional sort of picture in a vague kind of way, and he says, or you know, when a family isn't functioning in a healthy way, you you know, so the circle was mother overlapping with father, and 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 that might not always be the case. But then the children were sort of outside that circle and down below, and. I just remember from not understanding really why, because what he the lecture he was giving was important, but also vague in terms of this area of expertise, and and I just remember I had to excuse myself, and because I was still in therapy when I started university, I was right, I had to excuse myself and go to the bathroom and cry, because I'm like yeah, like like my parents were like there, and the golden child was over there, and I was somewhere else, but there were no overlapping circles. And I didn't even know what it meant. But the bottom line is that most people, I know a lot of people on YouTube, some maybe don't make it known, but the better people on YouTube have life experience also, whether maybe not so much like mine, but with a BP parent or something. I think in the case of one professional that talks about it, that's what I've heard anyway. And the thing is, so people have to have a motivation factor to want to specialize in this area because it doesn't matter what you take in university, psychology, social work, etc. It You're not going to come out of there with enough expertise to really deal with it. And then if you have lived experience, that helps. But it's, it's really people seeking after the information that's needed in this area, which I was always on the trail of for my own reasons. And and there's, I think, a couple of the YouTubers out there the same. So, uh, and that's, you know, and then again, you know, there, there are just so many um, mental health professionals that they, they, you know, we don't learn much about it in university. And so, and if they haven't had it in their life or their family or, you know, they're, they're not going to, and they might be codependent as all get out of here themselves, but no, they just won't be expert in this area. So it's very difficult for people. Just like it's getting harder and harder for people with BPD to find um, the right clinicians or to be able to afford therapy. And Sarah said, yep, not all therapists are, are good. One counselor told me to do marriage counseling. Yeah, worst suggestion you could ever get. And then told me I needed to work on not being so mean to my husband. Yeah, right. As if you were the mean one. Um, I know they just don't get it. And I don't know, was that counselor a woman or was it a man? Cause it's hard, you know, sometimes women will blow it that way too, but I don't know. I think like, and, and let me just stress again, the couple's counseling with somebody with untreated BPD is like going to be a total disaster. So I don't know why people reach out for that or they think, well, I can't get this person with BPD into therapy. So like, why don't we go to couples counseling and, and but that never works and guess what a lot of people train in couples counseling what is that called marriage and family they're they're usually often social worker level number one not there's anything wrong with that number two they don't have a clue about this area so number three they'll try to help you out and number four they're going to do a lot of damage because they're not going to get it 
And Alan said, don't waste your time on marriage counseling with BPD. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. Because there's nothing that, there's nothing I could even say really in these circumstances with a couple where the person is untreated with BPD and not going to hear a word I say either. Right. And then, and then it's just a matter of the person with BPD, whether they can get over on the therapist or not to side against the partner. I'm not that stupid, but the bottom line is, uh, it doesn't work for all kinds of reasons. Yeah. I'm sorry that you went through that, Alan, that you felt worse after. Yeah. Because I mean, so much, a lot of times mental health professionals who are dealing with this when they don't know what they're dealing with, they will just end up, you know, in over their heads and then they start to believe the person with BPD. And if you're, it not always is it the gender matter, but if you're talking to a female counselor, a marriage counselor or couples counselor, then she's going to likely side with the woman and against the man because you know, people with BPD have such incredible narratives, don't they? Which, you know, they're willing to compromise and lie about and exaggerate. And, and then they get into the defensiveness of what actually happened to them in childhood. And then they transfer that and project it out onto the partner. And, and, and so therapists who don't know what they're doing are thinking that the man is always the bad guy if the woman has BPD. Or maybe even vice versa, if the man has BPD and the woman is, you know, going to get all the blame for like, oh, you you know, well, you need to stop doing this and that to them. And the truth is they're doing it to you. And Rob said, it's just like some of those relationship books that people will turn to for help. Oh, yes. Good point. Oh, yes. The five love languages will not work with uh, anyone who's cluster B or even codependence. Well said, Robin. Good point, because I know I have a lot of clients that are just, well, they don't want to throw their books at me, but what they're saying is like they bought this book, that book, the other book. I'm not saying there are no books out there that are helpful to understand things, but not to help the person with BPA. So a lot of people are frustrated with a lot of books. And then don't even get me started on the empath narrative and the professionals writing books on that stuff. Hey there, Gary. BPDs are very convincing. Their entire life is about acting. Well, they can be convincing at times, but their entire life being about acting? Yeah, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. But again, the reason doesn't matter, you know, when you've been hurt by them. But the reason is because they don't know who the heck they are. So yeah, the, they're defensive and they're always trying. They, they, they want to be able to relate to people. But they don't understand what the gravity of their issues, you know, is or all about. So that was a bad sentence. But yeah, so they do end up essentially acting because they're acting as if without a self. But even after I say that as an explanation, I'm not trying to excuse what they end up doing then. Um, and Sarah said it was, it was like being in a horror movie for our sessions. I hated it only did three and he still was he still has written notes on what i said and how i put him down yeah he made him angry and oh and he thinks you lied wow yeah well hmm the it it really is the opposite of helpful to try couples counseling with people with bpd and even if it isn't actually the counselor that does a lot of, you know, gets in the middle and gets all things messed up. Like you said, Sarah, it can be, it can be the, the partner with BPD at the time who's going to skew everything, write it down, never let it go. And of course it'll be all skewed what they wrote down. So it's, it's just, you know, um, it, it's really, it's really terrible that you know, people have codependency and people have BPD. And when, when people come together, it's like, wow, there's, uh, you know, if it's your first time and for some people it isn't, and some people know better, but on they go. And, and some people make that choice. I mean, there's all kinds of people out there, but most people don't know in the beginning at all what could happen. And it's just that 
really horrible fit from, you know, and yeah, I mean, so many people are in so much pain and it, it's just so, I don't know, like, you know, there, there isn't enough funding for mental health. And the only reason I go this direction for a second is to say that if more people would get treatment, you know, they might not be able to be in a relationship for some years till they do that. But if they would be, if more people with BPD would get treatment for years, they would then be able to stop hurting other people and they would feel better about themselves and be able to stop hurting other people. So I think this is, you know, an exponentially growing problem. It's not getting less in society. It's getting much more. And, and now there's less funding, you know, there's treatment, but, and then in different countries, like I'm not saying Canada's perfect by a long shot because it's not funded well enough. And then the thing, mental health, and and then the thing is, you know, in the U.S., there's 50% of mental health professionals won't even deal with people with BPD. Not that they're all qualified to anyway, but I think the same issues exist in Canada and in many areas of the world. And I, I have some clients from Malaysia and Singapore and different countries like that where in those countries, they have... Like, they're not backward countries or anything, but they have some psychologists or whatnot. But, of course, it's, exor it's it, the price, well, it could be exorbitant anywhere. But they, you know, I was talking to a client recently from Singapore and one from Malaysia. They just don't have the resources even, you know, like of the clinicians to go to. And then it means that if there was somebody with BPD, neither does that person. And so then what do you do? You know, and then and then in the situations where people have children together and they're very young and it's, it's just, you know, this is the other thing. You know, I had a client say the other day, well, because they were they were sort of giving me a run for my money there. It was fine. But in terms of they were forwarding more of a biological argument. And I'm like, well, you know, OK. And I was just giving back my thoughts when they asked. But, you know. Because the client was saying that, you know, well, BPD does run in families. I'm like, yeah, but like more often than not, it's it's crappy, crappy parenting to crappy parenting to crappy because of woundedness. But anyway, it's it's like for this to change for a lot of people who haven't even fallen into it yet that are going to fall into it. Because, you know, that's it's one thing I'm trying to stay aware of on my channel. And I have to do maybe a few videos that are going to seem really basic to people. But I think I need to do some more basic ones because there are new people finding not only my channel, but everybody's channels um, every day. New people starting to type in, why is my girlfriend or my boyfriend or my husband or my wife doing whatever? And then they fall into this, you know, really daunting reality of what's going on, right? And and I know I don't get clients like this anymore, but I don't know how many years ago it was. I have a lot of clients that would say to me, um, especially men would say, oh, well, you know, when we first found out that it was BPD, I thought, well, good, there's a name for it. Like we can do something we can do about it, right? And I'm not saying all men are the same, but often in that sort of fix it, like, okay, here's the problem. Let's use the logic. There's nothing wrong with that. And let's fix the problem. But I don't have clients who come to me anymore to say that. So that's an interesting change as well, which, of course, is understandable. Because I think that was back probably maybe even as much as 10 to 15 years ago when there was even less uh, information online than there is today. Uh, Stephanie, any time we tried counseling, he would go out of his way to become friendly with the counselor. So I felt like I was taking... Um, I was talking to one of his friends during counseling. I never felt like they were neutral. Well, yeah, and that's what happens when people don't know what they're dealing with in the first place, right? The mental health professionals. Because, you know, you you want to be build a rapport with a client, but when you're if you're working with a couple, you, you need to do that with both people. So and and people with BPD whether, you know, I'm not going to say they all do it unknowingly because often they can, in a more minor way than a narcissist, but they can turn on some charm and they can be friendly. And 
And then to that point, right, so yes, there are certain things they do and certain circumstances where they can turn it off and on and they do know what they're doing. So, you know, there, there's that as well as the many times that maybe they don't know what they're doing. But, you know, I mean, I've done some couples work and I, I work with families. Not necessarily do I talk to them all together, but when I, when I've worked with couples, I, try never to work. I mean, I, I'll, I'll try, but I don't agree, you know, when people approach me with somebody with BPD untreated, that it's going to be very helpful. But the thing is, I've worked with people that have had, they're still together, and the person has had like three years, or four years, or five years, or maybe a couple of them had six years. Or BPD, they had therapy, so they weren't at ground zero. But guess what? They weren't further and far enough along to not still be falling in certain kind of splitting black and white devaluation places. And the key core thing there was, you know, it's, it's really difficult to know what to say to somebody with BPD sitting in front of you with their spouse, but there's no way I'm going to take sides. I mean, I'm going to be straight up honest about it as tactfully and as gently as I can be. And I'll never forget the one woman who said, and it was over really something small, but it was huge to her. But she'd had like almost four years of treatment for BPD, which again, like I said, it takes a long time. But what she was really, really furious about, triggered by, was was not a big deal, if you know what I'm saying. But to her, it was huge. At one point, she turned and said, you know, she, she looked over at her husband, she looked back at me, and she goes, maybe I should just start over with somebody else. And there it is, right? I don't know what happened with them. I would guess they'd probably end up getting divorced, but unfortunately, or going on in the same kind of agony for both, you know, for the for the husband for sure, but for her too. But I think that's where there is that idea, right? It's like the grass is greener syndrome. People with BP just externalizing things out that they don't understand what they're doing. That part they don't get, but they're still responsible for it. And then when she said that, I was like, it's so typical. It's like, here she is. This guy loves her. She can't see it. She doesn't trust it. The issue isn't that big. She can't get it. It's huge for her. So much so that she says, maybe I should just start over. To which I remember that I said, well, you know, um, you have children together, etc." And I said, you've done a lot of work. But there just might be some more that it would really help you to do. And then she just started bawling. And she didn't know whether to yell at me or yell at her husband or yell at both of us. But, you know, and then I got a chance to say a bit more. But, of course, what I was trying to say is the problem won't go away. And I did say at one point the problem won't go away if you decided to divorce your husband and find another man. I, you know, and I was trying to explain to her that it, it would, you know... To give her the idea that the problem isn't external in, in a roundabout way. Uh, or not roundabout, but not, you know, blunt. Um, Gary said, BP is so frustrating because it always seems that happiness is just out of reach. Tantalizingly close. Yes, it certainly can. Um, <clears throat> and I think I answered a question on Cora on this or something. Why why can't people BP be happy or what is something like that? But the fact is, a lot of people, probably a significant number of people with BPD, especially that are still untreated, they, and even in treatment, you know, mid-range treatment, it's got to be a lot of treatment before they can even know happiness or begin to trust happiness. It's really kind of a sad statement, but their lens is an entirely negative, distrustful, very protective one. So... In the five-factor trait model of personality assessment, people with BPD would essentially almost correlate at zero for trait openness. They, they're so closed, and the lens is pretty much on the black and white side. It's on the negative side. How you doing, Wheels? Um, <clears throat> you know, I wonder, Wheels, I hope you're doing well. Would you be able to look for a video that I did, a live stream clip, that starts with mindfulness and something. <laughs> That's all I know that it is. But if, if you have a chance, I'd appreciate it. But if you can't find it, no worries. Um, 
And Stephanie said, I had no clue he has, uh, I had no clue he had BPD. To begin with, he was like a chameleon. Yes, unfortunately, they are. Everything I liked, um, he liked until he got me in a relationship. And then the real him came out. Oh, so everything that you liked, he loved. Okay, yes. And, you know, they, I don't know if a lot of people at BPD understand that aspect or that part, but they're trying really hard, but they don't understand, you know, that they don't know themselves and aren't going to be able to relate successfully time after time after time. They don't seem to get that because they always will blame the person they're with and think that it's going to be better with somebody else. But yeah, in that idealization mirroring phase and their codependent aspect of along with BPD, they're people pleasing. And of course they don't like, not everybody with BPD is the same, but many, many people in treat with BPD, they don't know what they like or don't like. They don't have hobbies. They're not all the same, but so as soon as they're very chameleon, like, like I've given weird examples, right? You could, you could say your favorite thing to do is, is, is like, um, you know, get a human piece of hair and, and stick flies on either end. Cause I don't know, kids did that to me when I was in grade nine, pull the hair out of my head and we're doing that with flies or something. You could say that's your favorite hobby in the world. And they'd be like, me too. Well, obviously like, come on, whose hobby is that? Right. But they are very chameleon like, um, Sarah, does the negativity, um, lens from BPD rub off onto the family they live with? I think so. Our house was on edge a lot. Well, yeah, I mean, I think it does. And I think that there's also, you know, the, the house being on edge a lot would be one thing, but a negativity lens of experience, it's like, yeah, when you're on that emotional ro roller coaster with a person with BPD and then like in your household, what it was like, um, and when people have, you know, raising a family with somebody with BPD, et cetera, then what happens is everybody's walking on those eggshells and everybody's waiting for the other shoe to drop. So in that regard, yeah, like it, it's a lot of fear. It's a lot of hypervigilance. It's because you, you know, something's going to happen again and it's going to be painful, upsetting, negative, discombobulating, a huge drama and chaos. And it's not a matter of when it's, or sorry, if it's a matter of when. So definitely that's how the negativity crosses over into other people's hypervigilance of trying to like not trigger the person. But the thing is, you're not responsible for the trigger. So that doesn't really work either. So it, it very much does become other people's reality. The, the negative lens of people with BPN treated. I mean, I can think back in my life to what I was going through and, and seriously, you know, I think I had the odd happy time as a kid, but it wasn't at home. It wasn't with the family of origin. It was more like when I played sports or maybe I was playing outside with kids or something that, that might've been a little fun, but I mean, you just don't get a lot of positivity growing up in the kind of family of origin that I grew up in. and so. I mean, I could always laugh at comedy and stuff, but there wasn't much else that was funny. So, and then, and then with the defenses that are created from a very young age in BPD, everything is, it, it's instant defense and there's, you know, there's no self there. So they can't trust, they don't trust themselves or others. And if, whenever they try, it's like, it's a humongous, like there's going to be backlash because, you know, it's just, they can't. They don't have a self from which to even modulate, regulate, or be able to be vulnerable. So, um, how long ago did I post a clip? Well, I'm thinking maybe like within a two to three month period, but I know all I can remember at the beginning of it's called mindfulness. That's not much help. I'll just, um, quickly just look on my phone here while I'm trying to talk at the same time to see if I can, um, Oh no, if I look there, it's, it's too, there's too many videos since. So that's the other thing about that. Um, just a second here. I'm just typing something in here. It's, it's hard to like talk and do this at the same time.
I don't think I'm going to find it by doing this either, but let me see. Oh, my. The more videos you do, the less possible it is to find one at a given point in time. Oh, I know what, Wheels. If, if you look on my channel, look at my playlist. I have a live stream clip playlist. It probably would be in there. I'm just going to quickly try that, too. Live stream clips. Uh, let me see here. One second. Sorry. Um, yeah, wheels, it's called... Wait a minute. Is that it? No, that's not it. I thought that was it by the thumbnail. Darn. <laughs> um, it's called BPD Relationship Breakup Observing... Is it? Whoops. Whoops. Uh, no, I can't. A BPD relationship breakup, observing, mindful, mindfully, and ruminating, and probably something, something. But if you put in that much, BPD relationship breakup, observing, mindfully, and rumination, and my name behind it, I think you'll find it. And it is in the AJ Mahari Livestream Clips playlist. So I'm glad I thought of that, because otherwise it wouldn't be so findable. So, the more videos I keep making, the harder it is to find anything. <laughs> so, sorry for that there. Um, Fusion and the Fit. Love that name. Wow. You said AJ is a great counselor. Um, highly recommend. Well, thank you for that. And I take it that maybe I just don't know you by Fusion and the Fit, but that's fine. Um, and Al said, um, highly recommend AJ um, Top Shelf. Thank you so much, Al. Um, and was a pleasure speaking with you recently. And I hope that you got on with what, you know, you were going to, I hope that was went well, but we don't want to say too much here. And I also said, um, you're responsible for your own problems, just as you're responsible for your own liberation and enlightenment. Oh yes. Great quote. Very true. Um, uh, yeah, fusion. That is correct. Yeah, cool. That's not, no worries. People, uh, it's really interesting to me too, you know, when I've had people that have been on the channel, they've been commenting, they've been in live streams for maybe over a year. And then, you know, I'll get uh, somebody will purchase sessions and then I see this email and I see a name and I, I write back, you know, just like I would anybody. Right. And then they'll go, Hey, you know, good to hear from you. I'm like, I'm so-and-so like whatever the name is from YouTube. And I'm, and I'll remember, I don't remember some some haven't been around long enough or not but i there's lots i will remember and it's like oh wow and so yeah so i i guess i take it i know who fusion is but i don't know who fusion is by the name and that's perfectly fine because people have to use different names on uh, youtube and i like that fusion in the fit that is just wow i mean i could think about that for a while but i won't right now because that's not why i'm here but i do love that name It just, you could, oh, I don't know, it just brings up so many thoughts. Anyway, um, Sarah, uh, yep, now that I have the left the home, the kids say it's more depressing. Um, their BP dad, BPD dad is struggling, and he's really boring. They like to visit me and see me being happy. Um, soon they will leave. Oh, well, yes, and, well, it's probably positive for them that they will soon leave because, you know, they need more positivity in their own lives as well. And I guess one thing to watch out for there, Sarah, is just to, you know, if if, if your kids are um, codependents or not. And so hopefully they can go about their lives and, and not feel guilty and, and you know, ha have positivity in their lives and not worry about trying to rescue their father because it can't happen. Um, Gary, such great insight um, regarding trust, AJ. My BPD ex had terrible days following our greatest nights together. Yeah, that's the fear of engulfment there, too. Sorry to hear that. She said she did, didn't want to, quote, get used, used to, unquote, having a good time. She couldn't trust it. Yeah, that is, um, it's so true, and it, and it's tragic. But I mean, I've worked with, you know, I still do work with some people with BPD, but um, 
I don't mean to say this against people at BPD, but except for some who are really ready and engaged in the process, it's getting harder and harder to take clients that are sort of more at the, you know, the beginning point um, to the point where I might not even be able to do that much longer. So this is something else that, you know, this is it's just not easy for people at BPD to find the treatment that they need. But I, I was going to say, so I'm working with people at BPD. Um, I don't do this with everybody, but with many, you know, in the schema therapy modality and you, you know, you give um, assessment and they fill up forms for, you know, to to sort of look at what are the, the patterns or the schemas that are most predominant in, in a given person with BPD. And I have a lot of clients over the years with BPD that I've scored like 97 to 98% mistrust, you know, um, high 80s and above into the 90s with mistrust. If if they're sort of at ground zero and haven't had a lot of therapy or or you have a lot of self-awareness because not every BPD being the same, right, many do get some self-awareness and then do get into therapy and it helps. But even they will score eh, 70%, 75% in on mistrust it's a huge schema or pattern with people with bpd for sure uh wales um not doing great i'm sorry to hear that oh i'm sorry to hear you lost your contract on the first day because someone in the building you you were assigned to complained about you being in a wheelchair now oh, legal stuff i'm really sorry to hear that that's terrible um and Al said, oh, it's another quote. Good. I love I love the quotes you share um, or that anybody shares. The greatest problems of humanity are psychological, not material. From birth to death, people are con continually under the control of their mental sufferings. Yeah, wow. And LZR, I think I know who that is, but I'm not going to try to say it. So, and Wheels, you know, don't worry about it. Um, I'm sorry you're having a hard time. I'm going to go find that video myself right now. So I can just pop it in there. Yeah, that, that's a really excellent quote. So true that, you know, without a lot of awareness, often people aren't sure what they are suffering from. But again, and people of codependency, wow, it's such self-abandonment that no matter what people are suffering with or from, and, and, and with a person with BPD in particular, it becomes much more obvious. But until people become really aware of their pain or suffering or both, then they can just keep denying it, right? And, and in codependency, there's a big denial factor. Oh, I did not get the right list. Okay. I'm just going to try one more time. Wow. <laughs> I just, wait a minute. Nope. That's not it either. That's a different one. Apparently I have a video out there called BPDX is longing and ruminating codependency and emotional something or other. That's not it though. Okay. Why, why am I on a general search? That's not going to work. Wait a minute. I'm, I'm, um, okay. Um, yeah, Wheels is certainly going through a heck of a lot and, um, you know, so deserves to not be. And it's not easy to be somebody with, you know, I'll put it this way, Wheels, uh, you know, a physical difficulty or physical challenges in this world because there are always people out there who are willing to pounce on just about anybody for any difference whatsoever. And of course, that's not ever right. Just give me one more go at this. Um, there we go. If I don't try to do it on Google, okay, I think I'm about to find it. Whoops. Don't want to be hearing that. You know what it's actually called? I found it. BPD relationship breakup, observing mindfully and ruminating. It's, yeah, these titles get longer and longer, don't they? 
Oh, 700. It was done September 4th. Like, who knew? September, October. Okay, so just about two months ago. I, I couldn't remember. And 740 people have watched it. There you go. Stats and stuff. Who cares? So here's the title. Well, wait. I, if I have room for both in here, let's see. Uh, whoops. I hit that. Okay, but there is a title. <laughs> so coming in a moment is the link. Just, uh, you know, so so I don't know if people are still here that were asking when I was talking about this, but people watching back can check it out. I mean, I at least address it a little bit more in that video. So again, that's called... I need to do more on it, obviously. Uh, never mind the bit, but it's called yeah. Never mind the beginning, but observing mindfully to end room, you know, ending rumination. So that's what I'm really talking about there. Obviously, um, I don't need to say more about that than that. And that was taken out of a live stream when somebody asked me a question about that. So where I just went into it more. Um. Oh, let me see. Where are we here? Um. 1991 Windsor. One of my favorite quotes is, quote, if you don't heal what what hurt you, you'll bleed on people that don't cut you. Yes. Excellent quote. Excellent. I mean, there's so many of them out there, aren't there? And <clears throat> something that I recommend people try to do too, because, you know, positive affirmations don't change a whole lot. But if you can find a really inspirational quote, um, like like perhaps that one or what Al shared, but anything that's inspirational to you as an individual, they can be really helpful. Because you know, when I was in in recovery years ago, and um, I mean, I I used everything I could think of because you know I had to keep doing things, and um, uh, that you know I kept getting contracted not to do things, and so I needed to create change before I understood how I was creating the change. And so it was pretty stressful, but I use music. I use quotes, just all kinds of things. Um, and I also, the moment anger arises, your mind believes in a creator. You think that someone else is creating your problem. Quote, the problem I'm experiencing came from that person. Unquote. That is similar to believing in an eternal creator. Wow. Yeah. Well, and I think that, you know, one of the things I would say that people really need to be aware of after being with a person with BPD or whatever relationship type or narcissist is that, you know, they've done what they did and you're hurting and you're also still have this inner child that's hurting from your past. So you get the duality of this agony, but then the fear of moving on and the inability to let go and to radically accept it's over, which takes time for people too. But that that's actually how codependents then increase their own suffering. That, that doesn't mean you're responsible for what the person with BPD or NPD did to you. No, not at all. But then the denial of, you know, cause the fear of moving forward is huge because people fear change, right? And I think that's one of the reasons why people with codependency, it's not a conscious thing, but you want to get that other person to change because then, hey, everything would be okay. But guess what? I, I, I should really include this here. When people with BPD actually do heal and recover, which doesn't always happen within one relationship's time, but, but it did for me. I was with somebody for almost 13 years and uh, I don't know that it was 13, but I don't know, it was 10, 12. It was somewhere around there now. I have to sit down and figure it all out and do the math again. But in the 1980s, you know, and I think to 90, 90 or so, I'm not sure, in there somewhere. And, and, and you know, as I was recovering and, and getting closer, and just prior to probably when they told me I was recovered, but I didn't know where I was at, um, I changed so much, grown so much, found myself, you know, knew who I was and all of that got many more ideas about what I wanted. Life was really changing as it can, unlike some people out there say. But the bottom line was I looked across the room and I'm like, why am I with this person? Who, you know, in retrospect, I realized was a quiet borderline and had other issues, a lot of codependence and stress dependence. And like, so what could happen 
let's just say you can get that partner with BPD into therapy. And somehow, let's just forget the time crunch, but time goes by, lots and lots of it, years actually, but they get the work done and they get to, to, to almost heal and recover or they recover. Um, there's no guarantee they're going to turn around and look at you the same if you weren't in your own treatment recovery from codependency. So people with codependency see this whole pattern of the way this codependency is a dysfunctional relational style as well. And so unconsciously then, subconsciously, you do not do this consciously. You really believe that this person could just, not that they don't have insurmountable problems. They do, people with BPD. You just believe that they could fix all of that, then it would be okay. But you still wouldn't really be okay. And then more to the point, it's hard for people to hear when they're in a world of hurt. You're going to be so much more okay after it's all said and done because you get that golden opportunity for that personal change and that growth, which is, you know, you got to fight hard for it. It is not easy. It is painful. But so, and, and if you were to be with somebody with BPD that actually was in treatment and healing and recovering, changing all the time, and you weren't taking care of yourself and your codependency, chances are they would outgrow you. This is something people with codependency well, don't really need to worry about when you're with an untreated person with BPD who's not going to go to therapy. But the bottom line is this is healing, whether people are healing from BPD or healing from codependency, it is a big equalizer in terms of what's going on across the fence, so to speak. But people aren't going to be able to recover in a short period of time to save relationships. And then again, people with codependency need to do their own work anyway, but are so less likely to do it until it becomes really kind of urgent to start to do it. And I can relate to that too, because in my own journey with codependency in my life, there were a couple of different points at which it was like, oh yeah, crisis point time, like when I first got broken up with, um, and, and what an experience that was, and that was after I recovered from BP, but like, then I was like, oh yeah, like it was so painful. It was so different. It was, it was really, I'm so grateful for the experience, like all these years later, because I had to face a codependency again. And then I can't remember what the other thing was, but it'd be some years later, some years ago now, impetus to work even harder at it again, because it's not like somebody says to somebody or you realize, well, I have codependency. Um, yeah, I'm going to get right on that. It's not how it works. We tend to deny what we don't have an impetus to really face because it's difficult and painful. And, um, and Al said, this is how BPD is externalized when angry. I guess like in the sense of what you shared prior to that, is that what you mean? Um, and Sarah said, yes, I talk positive to myself about myself. <clears throat> and hope negative patterns in my brain will go away. Well, yeah, but more to the point, Sarah, they're not just in your brain. You know, negative core beliefs, that the pain and the negative thinking, it, it, you know, it's very much in your psychology. It's very much in your emotional landscape. So don't think it's stuck in your physical brain. It's not. Um, and you said I had years of being hard on me, and now I'm trying to be nicer. Yeah, well, and hopefully you're nurturing the wounded inner child, because it's about that and self-nurture. Because often people grow up and never really get their nurture needs met, if I could put it that way. Now, who was your recovery mentor therapist? Um, well, when I, oh, and then you put my name in the phone. Um, I, I was in a group therapy program toward the end. Like, I'd had a lot of therapy prior. And it was actually, there were five therapists in the program four regularly and one every once in a while that seemed to have something to do with me for some reason, but she was so helpful. Um, but she was the really tough love individual, if you know what I mean. Um, and so it wasn't just one mentor or therapist. It was actually five of them in the culmination of this. But however, I will say, thank you for that question, Al, because it just brought up a memory that gives me goosebumps, makes me want to cry a little, but also it makes me smile. There was a man, a beautiful man, 
when when I was about 18, so early on in the journey, and at the hospital where the shrink threw the label at me that I'd never seen the shrink before, wouldn't see him after, was never assessed, but whatever. I was seeing a social worker, and he was just like Burl Ives, if you know what I mean. He just looked like an actor that would play Santa Claus without the Santa Claus suit. He was... He had a big beard. He was a big burly. Yes, very, very sort of big man in terms of, you know, heavy man. Very full of joy, though, and very giving and very gentle and very loving. And boy, did I need all that from especially a man at that point and at that age. Um, And I just, his name was Bob Henry. And I can say that because I know he's no longer with us. And Um, and probably like even nobody back there at that time, like all these years later would still be there. And I'm not saying where there is, but I've never forgotten his name and I've never forgotten how hard he worked to just be there for me and in, in the beginning of things. And he was validating and I just remember him with such warmth. So I would say he was probably the first person on my journey because I remember him all these years. I remember the bad ones too, but I remember him so fondly and his belief in me, even at times, and probably we both knew I didn't get it yet, that I wasn't being a hundred percent honest about something. And I was pretty much honest about most things, but yeah, there was things I wasn't even sure of why I was doing certain things, but he, he gave me, I still have the book because I never returned it. That's not a good thing. Um, but he gave me the book, um, to read and uh, unfortunately I never did return it. So I still have it, but it means something to me now, even though I can't depend why I still have the book, um, a book called cry anger. And, you know, that book maybe didn't help me for a while, but it sowed some seeds for sure. So there was a man, I could say a social worker just a wonderful human being. And he was quite old. He was probably like older than I am now when I was like, you know, about 17 or 18. He was just an amazing man. He really was. And he was, he was there for me. And I think it was him that took me on a couple of visualization journeys. And I actually trusted him just enough to close my eyes and try because that was rare. And I saw some amazing things in the visualization because Leading up to it, and this is very early on in my recovery, obviously, I'm just the beginnings of, but he he took me on this whole journey. You're walking through a forest, picture a forest, all that stuff. And he says, and you come to an opening and, and there's a cliff far off, but there's no danger. And you see a girl there. See how I remember this? He says to me, I remember like I could almost hear his voice like it was yesterday. And it was like a lot of years ago, decades ago. And he says to me, so you see an opening there and, and there's a girl and she's drawing or painting on an easel and you walk up behind her. And I was picturing it all. I was with him, you know, and I wasn't resisting. And he said, what do you see? And I panicked and I kept my eyes closed. I go, I don't see anything. I don't see anything. What's that mean? And he said to me, take a deep breath. Don't worry about it. Close your eyes. Like in the, in the visualization, close your eyes open them back up, and he goes, take another look, relax, what do you see? This was a big moment in my life because I saw something in the visualization, and the answer was, I see a little girl hanging on the bars on a window like she's in prison, and that would have been my first reference without knowing it to my wounded inner child, to my lost self. So. Thanks for the question, Al, because I hope that wasn't too boring for people. That, But that was really special to remember because I just don't think about this stuff all the time or very rarely. And so, yeah, one Mr. Bob Henry was a very special man. Wow, I feel that right now. But it was other therapists that would bring me home, so to speak, to me, to self, and to healing, etc. Um Well, you know, Wills, I'm sorry to hear that, what you're going through, um, because, you know, it it can't ever change, right? And I know that you're working hard to try to get out of there, and you have a lot of obstacles, 
And the thing is that this is, you know, you're growing, you're working so hard on yourself. And also it's that you're still in the situation. And so you're going to run into more denial and you're going to still run into that self-doubt. And I think that the more that one has been gaslit by a narcissist, as you have been, and I know I was like two, a little bit like a long time ago, but to focus on you, that amount of gaslighting, it's almost like, I mean, it creates so much self-doubt in a person, no matter how hard you try to fight it, when you're still subjected to it, it's almost like the inner critic inside, the invoked internalized psycho, if you will, as you refer to your, you know, her, um, is, is gaslighting you. It's almost like you don't really gaslight yourself, but it comes up. And so that's where the self-doubt is. And every time that happens, you just have to realize there is no end to her crazy. And, and unfortunately, until you can get out of there, you're, it's never going to stop. And I'm just so sorry for what you're still going through. And Al said, maybe he has BPD Santa. Um, oh, I don't know. Um, I was just trying to describe the way he actually was physically. But, um, and, um, oh, well, you're welcome, Alan. Thank you for saying that. You said thanks for sharing. Um, it was a pleasure, really. It was, it was, yeah. I haven't thought of that for a long time. And, you know, it just, it surprises me, but it shouldn't. Because um, I remember in the group therapy, the therapist who, whose first name was Colin and he was in charge of the program and he was always the daddy object when I was in trouble. It was like, we're going into Colin's office. My prime therapist who was a female and would take me into Colin's office and it was, and I was a smart ass too. Cause I mean, I was, you know, going to university, I understood this stuff too, but that didn't mean I didn't need to help. And I'd be like, oh, so it's mommy daddy time, right? And here's where you're going to, like, he's going to be the daddy and you're the mommy and I got to listen. And, and they would just like roll their eyeballs. Like, are you finished? And then of course I would like suspend what I, what I was, you know, being sarcastic about to realize that, yeah, this is what it is, but you need to shut up now and like go through it. So, um, there were a lot of visualizations and other lessons and ways I learned from all those therapists in the group therapy program, but also calling in some visualizations too. But, and that was back in like the late eighties, 1990 area. So when I'm talking about what I just recalled there, thanks to your question now, um, that was 1976 or so to give you an idea how long ago. And I'm just surprised. I remember, I, I can remember more, but I won't share. I don't want to overshare. But I can remember more what he said. I can remember a couple other visualizations. I, I remember it all, which is really, I think, amazing in a sense because it was that important and he was that special to me. Something I never got to tell him, by the way, which is like sad. And I said, I was talking to um, AJ about a war movie in Afghanistan. The U.S. soldiers were under fierce attack. And during a break, they were calling loved ones. Yes. One guy was getting an earful from his wife on the phone. He was at war in both places. Uh, um, yeah, nice um, support for wheels there, Al. Um, oh, man. This white on black can get you. Uh, is that Minish? Um, you said, <clears throat> do they change? I've been promised after several months of no contact that this person with BPD has changed and worked on themselves. She said she is aware of all her BPD symptoms, and I do see a change. Well, you're talking early days there. Because, yes, people that pursue treatment for the full course of what that means for each individual, which is years, because my process was definitely 15 and a half years, um, from beginning to end, but it, you know, she might be realizing some things. I don't know if she's in therapy. That would matter too. But you said, uh, after several months, it's not going to be the kind of change that's going to be able to change the relational dynamic or the triggers within the relational dynamic for her or, or her relational. She hasn't been in enough therapy to find herself and change the way she relates to others yet. 
and to understand the way in which she gets triggered and how she externalizes that, et cetera, et cetera. So nobody with BPD is, she might be more aware of symptoms. That's positive. And you do see a change, but that is, you know, it's probably not enough to make a relationship try again, uh, work out. But with that said, very rarely does that happen in that sort of play, like with somebody just being, because, because a lot of her awareness will be also intellectual versus in her emotional landscape. And it's not from the intellect that people with BPD in recovery and in treatment learn how to change. It's actually a very, very deep emotional, psychological process. So I don't know. I, I would maybe think that if you do see a change that, you know, maybe you don't want it, to, it's hard to say, but I certainly wouldn't rush back into something. But, oh, oh, but then later you said she's in therapy, has been doing it for a few years. Well, um, a few years doesn't make for, for full recovery, but a few years can make for some change. So, or varying degrees of change for different people. So one thing I don't usually say on the channel and somebody was, there's a comment I'm probably going to deal with in a video about kind of trying to call me out on like where they think I contradicted myself, but no, but here's what I'll say to you, Minish, that in your situation, you really think long and hard about what this person has been doing in therapy for three years and if they're continuing and what they know, have maybe a talk about if, if you want to see emotionally what they understand, etc. But you see, not all people with BPD are the same. And there can be some people where they're, I'm not going to say like, you know, on the channel, it's so hard to be general, but to you specifically, I would say, explore it some more and take your time with it and see what's really happening there because that's different than an untreated person with bpd and they can make strides and they can make changes and certainly with three years and more or more in recovery she could well be able to um, regulate things a bit better being aware of the symptoms not being through them yet but that doesn't preclude the possibility that she could change something relationally then. So I say that to you as an individual that can apply to some people. It does not hold true for most. I just want to be careful in saying that, but, um, and certainly when I work with clients, you know, I mean, it, it, th there are, there's the odd different situation that, you know, I can't forward that in a general way online. And I said, not until they get treatment and it takes many years. Yes, 8 to 16 years. But what Minish is talking about is at least worth investigating with that individual because, again, they're not all the same. So I don't know that individual, but the person asking about them knows them. So I would just say, be cautious, go slow, check it out, see what's happening. Because there are times when people will be able with BPD to do things that most people with BPD or that most people are experiencing people with BPD untreated will not be able to do. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, Will, is that the people around you, yes, they don't think you deserve anything different, but you need to hang on to knowing that you absolutely do. And I, I can appreciate how hard it is to believe. Uh, yeah, I know it hurts. And I'm, jeez, uh, I wish there was something. Like, you know, you you bring not only the empathy out of me, which is fine. I have empathy for you. But you bring out a little bit of that latent, like, not really alive anymore. Codependent rescuer wants to go, I wish there was a way to just haul you out of there. Because I wish I could. And But, you know, that, yeah, I hope so much for you to get free of there. Um, and I'm so sorry that you're hurting. Um, really am. Al, uh, to wheels. Yeah, but, but wheels, you know, I think wheels are going to answer you there. Al, it's, um, Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Wheels, because 
Yeah, and, and you have to stay in that fight and, and stand up for yourself. And Alice said, no marriage, um, job, or amount of money can justify the pain you're suffering. Um, I'm not sure what that word is. Um, rather, oh, you would rather be broke or jobless than putting up with BPD. Yes, yeah, stop. Understandable for sure. Whoops. Um, me and my scroll issues. Minish. I've been hanging out with her recently, and we were planning on doing a first date this weekend. Well, yeah, go really slow and just see, you know, because cause certainly rushing back together wouldn't be appropriate. And also, yeah, just, just you never know, because there are people with BPD out there. They're not all the same. There are certain individual circumstances that aren't like all the rest, so to speak. And Alice said, don't worry, I'm a slow learner. It took me 20 plus years. Well, just realize that what Minish is talking about is a different situation. And to what degree, I don't know. And they may not know, but they'll find out and go slow. So, it, you know, not all situations are exactly the same, but unless somebody addresses something specific like that, I don't talk about the lesser a uh, percentage of people where things might be somewhat different in the dynamic or with the person if they're really working hard in treatment. So, cause so many people are dealing with untreated people with BPD. Um, Scott, my ex, um, where'd that go? It just jumped. It didn't go far. I don't think, Oh, you, you took it away. Okay. I can't read it then. Sorry about that. Um, I want my story about that. You re retracted it. I'm not sorry. I just can't read it. Um, oh, you're welcome, Minish, because, again, there is individ individuality in, you know, in the circumstances of people with BPD. And when they start seeking treatment and and somebody with three years of treatment, one person with BPD can be further ahead than the other. It's not full recovery, but it can make a difference. Um, Al, don't forget they cycle so they can believe and appear to be better, but it's cyclic and will come around again. Yeah, but you know, Al, um, I hear you, and that's the majority of untreated people with BPD for sure, And but there are some individuals out there who aren't the same as the majority, so I'll just put it that way. Um, Xavier, I'm over 40, and my BPD is under 30. It makes her having ghosted me, discarded me that much harder. She's super smart, beautiful, and fun. I will never be the same. I just wanted to reword it quickly. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. Well, no worries. So your name's appearing as two different things, I think. But that's okay. Um, yeah, no, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, and I'm not sure why that makes it harder, but I think it would be very difficult, you know, regardless of age difference. Um, but she sounds like otherwise she would be a very desirable woman, you know. And, um, but unfortunately she doesn't have the emotional maturity and, you know, doesn't know who she is, et cetera, et cetera. And so I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, and of course she's still at an age where, you know, if she could just get into treatment now, it could matter, it could make a difference, but not necessarily for you, but in, in her life, you know, going forward, but. And, that, and that's another thing, too, about people's fear of moving on, you know, the thought that many, many clients have asked me, many comments on the channel have said, but, like, will they be better with the next person? Or, you know, if, if I let go and it's over and I don't try anymore, like, will they um, get better and I'll miss out on, you know, who I thought they were in the beginning? Will they become that person? Well, that entire journey is a lot of years down the road if they engage treatment and so and then they won't be the person that you met in idealization anyway because they'll be a more grounded person they'll be who they really are after you know significant uh, long-term treatment so many people have that fear of moving on as well and and that's hard because Again, it's sort of looking for them to become again who they were in, in the idealization phase. 
So that also keeps people from letting go and in fear of moving on to, to start healing and go forward. Uh, because, you know, if you do that in your life and they end up going through years of therapy and changing, and by that time you'll have moved on in your own life too, but it's really difficult now. And Scott said, my BPD ex reached out yesterday and wants to get back together. She's had therapy and seems better, but after we called for a while, she told me that she slept with her other ex two weeks after we broke up. And obviously I'm pretty hurt by it, but I feel like I might try again with her in a month after I accept that. Do you think that that's a good idea? Well, um, yeah, it's really hard to say. It's like you said that she's had therapy. Um, how much therapy has she had and how long has it been since you broke up? You, and then you said, uh, what was it? Um, she's had therapy. Well, they can seem a little bit better without being a whole lot better. Um, so two weeks after she broke up with you, she slept with her other ex. Okay. Well, technically that's not cheating. Um, I think it depends how much therapy she had, you know, um, and are you seeing changes like the way that Minish describes seeing changes? Cause that, that's really, uh, a big indicator one way or the other. Um, so without knowing how much therapy she had, I really can't answer if it's a good idea because unfortunately still more often than not, it's not a good idea. But again, um, I can't really tell you because I don't know you or her. Um, Al said, sorry about your pain um, to Xavier. The same thing uh, at the same age situation happened to me. When she cheated, um, she said, quote, at least I went for an older guy, unquote. Yeah, well, no accountability taking there for sure, eh? And, um, yeah, you're welcome wheels. I wish there was more that I could do or that we could do. Um, Scott, she's been going to therapy for about a year. Oh, but she's 17 and, and, and you're 18. If that changes anything, it's also been six months. She told me she slept with the guy once. Well, you know, Scott, um, this is probably going to be hard to hear, but I would say to you, She's 17, been going to therapy for a year. That's that's excellent on her part. But you're both still so young. I would encourage you to think about moving on and, you know, getting into your own healing recovery and therapy and dealing with maybe some codependency issues and, you know, starting over, moving forward, taking care of yourself. Because, you know... Um, the fact that you're 18, you're young, she's 17, that's very young. She's probably got a journey ahead of her. And no offense to anyone that age, but you still have a little bit of maturing to do in general. And she has a whole lot to do, plus recovery. So I, I would suggest to you that at that young an age, um, it'd be in your best interest to, to move forward and to seek your own healing and recovery and look at Maybe any codependency, you might still even live at home, I don't know. But I would I would really think that, you know, this. I don't know if this is your first girlfriend, your first dating experience, but I would recommend against it, but I don't know you. And obviously you have to make your own choices. But I would say at your young age, be best for you to look at how you got involved with somebody with BPD and to really set yourself, you know, to, to reach out and, and work with someone, look at your family of origin, which you you might still be really in and, and try to really understand yourself better going forward. Look at the boundaries that you need, etc., so that you can really create the healthiest opportunity for yourself. That would be my, my two cents worth. Um, Al quote, once you realize the true evolution of your mental problems, 
you'll never blame any other living being for how you feel, unquote. Yeah, it's a good quote. And Scott said, it's also long distance. Oh, well, absolutely, Scott. I, I would recommend against it. Um, so I feel like moving on might be best, too. I'm glad to hear you thinking about that. It's just hard to accept because she was my, oh, first girlfriend, and I like her a lot still. Well, yeah, and that's not, certainly not an easy, you know, experience with your first girlfriend, but it's going to teach you the resiliency of how to let go when things aren't working out, which is pretty important. And the fact that it is long distance means, too, you really can't gauge, you know, what's happening with the therapy or her changing or even really who she is if you haven't spent much actual time really in the same physical place. So, um, and I would just encourage you to think about your, your family of origin whether or not you think that you would benefit from looking into codependency and or, you know, I think you would benefit from working with someone just maybe for a little while just to understand what happened there and give yourself the best chance going forward. And you said it's also just hard to say say no and let go when she's going, um, when she's open to talking again and trying to be so convincing um, in it working again. Yeah, but, well, I hear you on that, Scott, for sure. But remember that it's long distance. There's a lot of variables. At her young age, it's going to take her a while to find her footing, find herself, and go forth from her therapy. And so, you know, the the fact that it's long distance, too, and at your age, um, this is a good time in your life, Scott, even though it sucks, to learn this lesson and to establish better boundaries for yourself. And I'm sure that, you know, she has wonderful qualities, but um, what's the rush at your age? You know, um, I hope you'll take care of yourself because there's so much for you to learn here. And the letting go of a first girlfriend is is really going to be difficult anyway. And But it, it will help you to grow. And uh, Minish, I caved in recently and agreed to go out on a date with an ex-BPD. I'm beginning to regret this decision, but don't know how to inform my ex of this. Can I just text her? Um, so I guess you went out on a date with a different ex with BPD then, right? Um... I would say that would be best done in a conversation and not in a text um, because, you know, your tone of voice and, and you know, yeah, it would be best done in, in, not in a text. That, that would be my opinion. Just, you know, you can think about that. Oh, you're welcome, Scott. And you said, keep up the work with your channel. I've been watching for a while, and it's been so helpful. Well, I'm really glad. And I hope you'll take care of yourself, because I don't mean any disrespect as an old lady to you as a, as a young man. But just know that, you know, you're just starting out, and give yourself a chance to grow, and learn some more, and, and, and learn more about boundaries, and red flags, and things of that nature. And yeah, so I hope that you'll take care of you first and and recognize that a difficult ending to a first girl, you know, dating relationship is is going to be quite a teacher. It's really going to help you going forward in your life. Oh, you haven't gone on the date yet. Oh, you agreed to go. Well, you know what? If you, if you don't end up going, if you it, oh, so Oh, you want to inform that person that you don't want to go. Then, yes, I would say you could just text that person. Sorry, I misread that. Yeah, if it, if it's the ex with BP, that another ex, that you were going to go on a date with, that now you don't want to go on a date with, yeah, in that circumstance, uh, yeah, just text her that, you know, you're sorry you can't make it or whatever. Um, 
Oh, thank you for that, Al. You said I highly recommend a one-on-one -on -one session with AJ. Thank you so much for that. Um, oh, I'm getting confused here, Minish. Sorry. You said same X as before. Same X as before. Oh, so you said that you would go on a date with recently with her, and now you're beginning to regret the decision. Um, then, then I'll go back to my original opinion, since I wasn't really mistaken then. I will say it would be better if you did it in a conversation. Uh, and just prepare what is an honest reason, but one that you can say without it, it reflecting on her, right? If that makes sense. So I would, I would recommend in that case, sorry, I, you know, my original statement stands that I think it would be better done in a conversation than a text. Um, I know, wheels, hang in there. I mean, you got to catch a break, hopefully sooner rather than later, in terms of at least, I don't know, getting out of there. That's the biggest issue right now. But I know that working might have helped you with that. And and then facing discrimination. I'm so sorry to hear that. So, but definitely I think that, you know, for most people, yeah, like, I, so maybe somebody will leave a comment on this and say, but AJ, you contradicted yourself. Well, but, you know, there is a vast, this is why I'm saying all people with BPD are not the same. And so to the majority out there of people and people on the stream here who are dealing with people that are untreated or that are exes now, then, you know, yeah, I mean, pretty much I keep it pretty consistent. But I know in client work and what one person on the stream here has said that, you know, you never know. So somebody's had three years of treatment and it doesn't mean they rush back together, etc. But it means that there might be some modicum of an opportunity to slowly see about that. But again, that's so there are different circumstances and I run into them in client work as well. And it can be very different from what most people are experiencing out there. What I'm usually talking about on the channel and the reasons for that. And, um, 1991 Windsor, um, mine hasn't tried to reach out to me in just over a year. When I rejected him, he sent, um, some scathing messages wishing, uh, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, but I, I can't bring myself to block him. Well, and you know, I hear that. I mean, it's a struggle, isn't it? And yet I think that it would be an important step for you to take at some point sooner rather than later. And that there isn't a way to really make that feel good or feel good about it or be ready to do it. But I think it's time that you take that step for yourself because, you know, the messages that you got back are, are you know, certainly no indication of why would you want to receive another message? But, you know, that taking that step of blocking and going full no contact is another step toward the letting go, right? Which probably brings up the fear of moving on and, and, and continuing therapy. But it it's a more final step. But I, I would just encourage you to do it as soon as you can because if you don't do it, you're creating this you're feeding an aspect of codependency and denial within that. That's going to be a block may well have been a block in, in at least one part of a block or one block in your recovery process in general and from codependency specifically. Um, well, yeah, it, it, it's interesting because I guess Manish, when you, when you do set that boundary and I would recommend a conversation versus a text, then 
like Al was saying, you know, you might get a reaction that shows you right there that, wait a minute, some change is good, but maybe there's things that, you know. So um, you should definitely follow your gut instinct there. There's some reason why you're not feeling like you want to go through with what you agreed to. And um, it's important to trust that gut instinct because, you know, we do have a gut brain. So there are two brains. The gut brain has more neurons in it like to the count of trillions more than the brain in our heads. They communicate via the polyvagal nerve. But the thing is, there's more communication going from the gut brain to the brain in the head than vice versa. So you've had a strong gut instinct there for a reason. So I encourage you to follow it. And like Al said, you know, you might have an answer there. Um, and, you know, because they can rage at rejection. And, and so you might, you know, that that's why it's best to do it in a conversation. So you get that immediate response that you can see, you know, if, if she's got a difference in the way she responds to your canceling something that you originally agreed to, which is actually, like I said, good for you to follow your gut instinct, but also not just a test for a test sake, but watch what a reaction is like and see how she handles it, because that will be informative for you. Yeah, I hear you on that wheels. And and now a legal fight on top of things. I'm you know, it's a lot to go through for sure. Now it's like teaching a pig to sing. <laughs> I've heard that one before. Um, it wastes your time and annoys the pig. Yeah, and there might be some mud and everything in the way too, in between. Yeah. It might be like a situation as clear as mud, which I've said often about these relationships. And when people try to figure out what happened after, you know, it's like things are about as clear as mud often. Um, oh, yeah, I also said serotonin is made in the gut. Yeah, well, the gut brain, there's a lot to that. There's an excellent documentary. I've talked about it before. I think it's called Gut Brain. So it's not called The Gut Brain. It's just called Gut Brain. And I no longer am boycotting Amazon Prime, but um, I used to have it, and that's where I saw it. And so I don't know where else it might be available, but that's one place. Um, it was in the Canadian one. It's probably in the American one. I don't know about every country, but it's a 55-minute documentary, but it just explains it really well. You know, so, I mean, I, I understand there, there's now pioneering work, um, when I say pioneering, it doesn't mean it's more important than other pioneering work, but polyvagal therapy, you know, and, and so the gut brain is super important. And so is following gut instincts because we need to at least stop and pause and really then critically think as well as feel what we're feeling, what we're thinking, what's the gut instinct telling us, because it's not just some woo woo thing. Um, it's actually been something that fires from the gut up to the head. And then it's like, wait a minute, um, I have this, it still is more of a feeling than a thought, but if you stop and pause and think about it, then that, you know, cause, cause not every gut instinct is going to be hundred percent right on, but more than not are going to be. And, um, yeah, it, it's both you see, like what you're saying out to wheels, both your situations are um not totally dissimilar but but somewhat have you know some similar similarities but are also different but yeah it's just really important to keep you know fighting the good fight so to speak and um wheels has been really doing doing that and it's it's got to be very difficult at times for sure i mean it's always difficult but more difficult at sometimes than others and um, Al said, gut health and eating right. Yes, but um, but the aspect of the gut brain is, I mean, yes, we want to have a healthy gut and everything too, but um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but that, that gut instinct is really important. So I have a video that I've done already, but I think I have to edit it. And it, yeah, it's got something to do with the gut brain and how codependence, but a lot of people, well, a lot of people have codependence anyway. 
but a lot of people ignore the gut instinct. And then, <clears throat> you know, there's a kind of a different subject I'm talking about in there too, but for people with codependency. So it's really important to realize that, you know, like, and what, what, I'm sorry, what's the number? 1991 Windsor said, you know, full no contact, closing that door makes, it, it, it is, is very difficult, but it is one big action that people need to take sooner, hopefully, rather than later, because until you close the door, you sort of got one foot straddling the abyss and the possibility and fueling the rumination and one foot trying to go, you know, step into the fear of moving on and accepting that it's over. But how can you do that when you're straddling the abyss of, but like, and even though he hasn't contacted you, you haven't blocked him. And the last time he contacted you, it was obviously um, not not a very appropriate way to contact anybody about anything. So you have to ask yourself why you're leaving yourself open to that. And I'm not just speaking to you with this because so many people have to ask themselves that very question. And I know that there's been people on live streams before saying, but I just don't feel ready to go no contact. It's not about what you feel. It's not about being ready. It's not about that it's going to feel good. It's about really stepping up to the plate for yourself and doing something really that feels impossible, doing something that feels really difficult because it's about making, as I've said before, the most difficult choice. The most adverse choice is going to be the one that's going to give you the most push forward and 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 it's complicated and it's not simple but without that full no contact it's it's a block to recovery for people so i don't want to be saying that at anybody individually but it definitely is and i see that with clients all of the time and i can't tell people to do it but i strongly encourage people to realize that it is an action step that is necessary to remove yet another block to ending rumination, to really getting on a path of recovery because you got one foot in the abyss. And if you stay in that position, it, it's, it leads to stuckness despite other efforts because full no contact is really that huge in most of these situations. Well, I hope, I hope, you know, I know it's really tough wheels, but I, I don't know if it's really aging you faster, but I'm sure it's exhausting and I'm sure it's overwhelming and so much to deal with and then some. And Al saying, I guess for 1991 Windsor, take a leap, uh, a leap of faith, a, a leap of belief in yourself and a leap for yourself. But Al says, take a leap and go no contact. And and it is often a leap for people, but just remember, as I always put it, it's not simple, but be the kite that chooses to fly higher into the wind because then you're going to learn how to soar in your healing and recovery. Soar meaning not just be sore, of course, and be, be in, a, in pain, but really start to find some movement through that pain to decrease your suffering and move forward. Because not being, even though you haven't been contacted, the emotional effect, or, or if someone else hasn't been contacted, the emotional effect of leaving that door ajar. It's sort of like if you lived in a high crime neighborhood and in the world we live in today with everything going cuckoo all over the place, would you leave your front door open like two and a half feet? And be able to go sleep comfortably without worrying about what's going to come through the door. This happens psychologically to people even if they're not contacted. Because you're still wrapped up in the focus to one degree or another. Of, Will he contact me again or not? Leaving the door open. And leaving the door open is just counterintuitive, counterproductive to moving forward and, and being able to heal.
So, and with that, I think I pretty much said all I can tonight. And I hope that, um, like, you know, it was people shared and people are been supportive to each other. And I hope that I was helpful where people ask some questions and lots of difficult, always, you know, tenuous and unknown areas in the recovery of, you know, after a BPD relationship breakup or being ghosted and with codependency and need to recover and heal from that as well. And, you know, codependency in and of itself can be block, you know, accepting, letting go, and then a relationship is over, can also play a major role in the fear of moving on in and of itself because of the aspects of denial. And a lot of people with codependency don't realize to the, the, the extents to which they have been subconsciously going to to avoid that very precious self that you need to heal and know better and you need to heal from the relationship as well. So codependency tends to be sort of comes replete with the denial and other things like like not making a difficult choice to go no contact, which is not an easy choice ever, but a necessary one that people with codependency tend to avoid things. People with codependency tend to deny things. So codependency in and of itself can present the block to, you know, getting through the fear of moving forward and, and letting go of an ex and accepting that something is over. Because for a lot of people with codependency, depending why you have codependency from your childhood, it can be much more difficult to to kind of accept an ending and to work to work forward from there. And then like a lot of people with codependency, some people are really ready and willing to to lean into that process and to look at self. And then it's still difficult to do. And many people are still just not quite ready yet. And I have some clients who are kind of straddling that line in between and and continuing forward. So, because, um, you know, codependency is daunting in its own right, and it's not easy to recover from, and it's a process, and it takes its own amount of time for people. It certainly doesn't take the same years of time as recovery from BPD, but it it isn't going to be without pain. So once again, I just want to leave you with, the reality that it's pain that's in the way and it's what's in your way that is the way and you can't go under it and you can't go over it and you can't deny it and try to go around it the only way through from from these relationships and with your wounded inner child and having codependency to getting into healing and recovery and moving forward and the fear dealing with the fear moving forward and accepting endings and when a relationship is over is through the pain because that's what's in the way and it is the only way. It's something I learned early in my healing recovery journey many, many, well, three decades ago and a little bit is that we need to learn how to lean into the pain. So we need people with codependency need to really look at, you know, do you have that negative core belief that most of us get taught in life anyway? Uh, growing up that pain is bad and and the opposite pleasure is good or happiness is good but or maybe being alone is like horrible but being in a relationship no matter how bad it is better than being alone nothing could be further from the truth and so people need to learn how to lean into their own pain because yes it's going to hurt no kidding i won't you know kid you about that but when you're working with a skilled professional also to help you, you know, uh, you can learn how to manage and cope with and actually begin to welcome and embrace pain. And I learned that on my healing and recovery journey because I started, the more I learned how to deal with it, lean into it, um, the pain I started to, you know, when I was having flashbacks and different things. I wanted to provoke them, trigger them to come. I wanted to feel more. I wanted to be challenged more because I grew in my competency to cope with the pain. And that is what people need to learn to do after these relationships and with codependency 
in that dualistic recovery process. And slamming the door no contact is something that at the very least, uh, people, I want to be careful how I word this, really need to take responsibility and get it done for yourself. Yeah, it's very good, Al. So everybody take care and just remember the pain that's in the way is your only way. It doesn't leave you with a lot of choices, does it? But this crisis is the biggest growth opportunity of your life. Which side are you going to take to focus on which side of that equation are you going to put your energy toward? And if you want to get back to yourself, to know yourself even better and more so for the first time in your life and get into a healthy relationship and a functional healthy relationship to and with yourself, then you must ch choose the choice that goes through the pain because it is the path way forward. Whether you have fear of moving on or not. So everybody take care. Look forward to the next time. Keep watching. And if you're watching those videos and they resonate with you, remember to thumb them up. And don't be a passive viewer. And hey, if you got something to share, question to ask, welcome your comments too as always. Thank you for that, Al. Everybody take care now.